welcome everybody to the second tutorial on the assignments for the course, but also to give people who are implementing the manual some guidance on this particular topic and, and chapter. So it's the collection documentation management um, chapter in the manual. And it was our second session in the course. So what does collection documentation cover? So this is something that not many people really give a lot of thought to, but there's a lot of documents associated with collections. So there's the accession register, there's a catalog book, information about the collections, so there might be historical documents, there might be summary type documents. Then there'll be all your policies, standards, procedures. There can also be all your different forms and templates that you have. There are all your monitoring and assessment records. So um, a, a monitoring for pests, your climate monitoring, your risk assessments, uh, disaster records, what happened. So there might have been a pest infest infestation. There might have been a flood. Um, it might have been a fire, there might have been something else, so a record of that and what you did and, and all your disaster um, procedures. <clears throat> then all the health and safety records, incident reports, training. So if you've had a evacuation, fire evacuation practice, um, that should be documented. All your monitoring for health and safety, so it might be your air quality monitoring. And it might be tests that you've done for chemicals. And then all your access records. So it might be your visitor request forms, a visitor book, all your loan forms, all your tissue supplied, every time you've su supplied data or images. And then documents relating to the collection. So this is about your specimens. So it can be field notes, data sheets, images, art, notes made by researchers. Anything that's been done or happened to the collection or anything that's been done um, to each object individually. So, that, so those you can see, that's a huge amount of documents, whether they're electronic or in um, paper or in books, there's lots of documentation. And of course, if you're going to manage these collections as scientific resources, so they, it, it's the basis of your research of your science, there needs to be a, a process of maintaining all of these documents, organizing them and making them accessible. So that's why you need documents about your documents. So it might sound a little bit over the top, but you really need a policy and procedures and standards for these documents. And so that's what this um, chapter is about. And that's what the webinar was about um, earlier or last year. So the second assignment, and I think that this is a very valuable um, aspect for, for anybody implementing the manual, it's early on in the process. If you don't have systems and processes for your documents, then you're gonna end up losing documents or not being sure where they are and you'll duplicate effort. So the first thing to do is to do an assessment of the current status of your collection documentation. So to look at what you've got is one thing, but then also to look at where is it, how is it stored, who's got access to it. So that was the, the first part of the assignment was to complete a table. Um, and this is a table, so it's, in, it's a Word document, it is on the website. And it goes through all the documents, but you'll see like under number four, policy standards and procedures documents. So it doesn't specify which ones. But at the bottom, it does say that you can actually compile a list of all the policy standards and procedures documents that you do have. So for this, we just wanted to know, have you got it? Um, have you got it for the institution or have you got it for your collection specifically? Because often um, you might be in a, in a big institution that's got many different units and you don't know what they've got. Um, and you might have your own 
um, documents. So it's really in some institutions not an issue. It's just one collection, but in other institutions, it might be fragmented. Where is it kept? Can all staff access it? Is it up to date? When was it last updated? And then any notes about it? So to complete that table, and I'll be interested to know from people who have done it or who have started trying to do it, where did you find the information? How did you go about compiling? I mean, if, if I had to do this, um, I would just scratch around. So looking on, um, you know, it, do you have a central folder? Do you have a website? Do you have an inner web? Do you have a share in Google? Um, you know, just look, look for that. Look on your website, look on your inner web, look in your library, go and see if you've got old um, catalog books or accession um, registers in the library. And it might be in your own office, it might be in someone else's office. Uh, and see what you can find, go through the table and complete it. Checking the documents that you find for each in the table. So if you just don't know, then you can say, I'm just unknown or uncertain. So let me stop, stop sharing there and let's just get some input from people who have tried to do this or have done it. Lee? So this was a very, very valuable exercise, Michelle, and I think I shared in a previous um, documentation webinar discussion forum that I actually added two or three columns to it uh, because a lot of time, and I think people have heard me sharing this, you know, uh, staff do not understand the importance of um, having this documentation, not through any fault of their own, but just because we don't actually speak about the underlying compliance and regulatory um, importance of having these documents. So two or three columns that I've added to the table is actually, is this um, towards Graph 103 compliance? Um, and so therefore it's a must to have. And then as well as the various acts and regulations that actually that documentation feeds into or supports in terms of if ever you're audited in terms of your compliance. And that really made it clear cut, um, at least when I discussed it with the, um, you know, the researchers, the curators at the museum. And in fact, this became quite important because it was required at um, higher management level in the municipality with regards to well, what regulations and acts govern our activities and how do we ensure that people are compliant. So it was a very, very worthwhile exercise. Um, some of the things we found, you don't actually need documents, so to say. We've um, I've, I've indicated where if you do want hard copy, you, for instance, the conservation efforts of specimens, you can generate that from, we have a form in, in specify, a treatment and an audit form. And um, so, yeah, so it's also where we, we, we absolutely need the hard copy documents and then where one needs to revert to, to, to specify. But yeah, it also directed efforts in terms of where we need to concentrate on developing new documents. Um, new SLPs. Um, obviously, stuff with like Section 20, that's a whole, <laughs> there was a whole lot of, of working on, on SLPs and, um, you know, infrastructure checklists and, and, and so forth. Um, but yeah, a worthwhile exercise. So, so thank you. Okay, thanks, Lee. So I think that's a very important um, point. So I just spoke about the scientific credibility of um, the collection. And why you need everything documented in terms of the scientific credibility. But Lee has raised a very important point, and that's about legal compliance. And so we know that the auditors um, do come and they always want to know what, what, what's your policy on this? What procedure do you follow? How was that decision made? Who signed off on it? Um, who authorized this? And that's why you need those records as well. And then also just for your permitting, 
um, and access and benefit sharing and what you've done that also all needs documentation and you need to manage that documentation because you know the auditors usually give you like a day or two to go and find it and if you have to scratch through thousands of electronic files or physical files um, you will be in trouble with the auditors okay thanks lee derek hi um thanks michelle the to start from i i don't have an existing collection but we do have an existing collection of osteological basically bones that are from the, the taxidermy department which i want to accession so mine's most of the questions are going to be answered no but this is important because it's helping me realize how many how many document how many forms everything that needs to be stored and that it needs to be put in a special place like the accession register we have a strong room that's where that will be kept you know but the catalog book that's digital it's going to be on specifier um uh, the monitoring and that stuff it's all files on the climate control reader things that's all digital so that's all stored digitally you know on the server um yeah and then the rest will you know we'll have to get a uh, filing cabinet and put everything in there um but yeah i found this very useful but like I said, everything's no at the moment because I actually haven't got, we're busy building the storeroom at the moment, busy preparing the area where the bones will end up. At the moment, they're just in boxes and plastic bags. They're labeled. Um, but yeah, we also have to draw a line when it comes to uh, the policies. We have to, just, these are old bones and anything new needs to have, have paperwork attached to uh, permits and all those sort of things. Um, yeah, that's me. Yeah. So, yeah, I have started it. I've got quite far in that table. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Derek, so you're at, you're at East London Museum, hey? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So, so is there not anything at an institutional level? Um, so, so this is, this is what I was saying. So sometimes it can be quite difficult to know when you need your own things and when... Mm to follow um, a broader institution level yeah. um, policy or system or process, because obviously um, you often can't set up separate things for every, every collection. Hmm. Uh, like I said, at the moment, all the accession registers are in a strong room. So Mary's is in a strong room, Phil's is in the strong room, Kevin's is in the strong room. Um, I'll, you know, I don't, I'm not in charge of a collection, so I'm just using this new bone collection as a working example. But ultimately, uh, you know, Kevin, my colleague, he's he's in charge of that. So anything I do here or do for that collection, it goes through him as well. So that, you know, he's also aware. And, um, but like I said, you know, when it comes to policies and stuff, we, we use the ICOM stuff. We don't actually have institution specific stuff uh, documentation and policies uh, but doc uh, the sorry the um, disaster records that's being kept by uh, my colleague Jonathan he does he he does all those things. sorry um yeah we have dedicated staff to do some things so th those things are stored and recorded and kept by those staff members the, like the disaster records we have someone in charge of doing you know drills and stuff like that and yeah i don't know i hope i'm making sense <laughs> yes, and i think that i think that your situation is probably where a lot of people find themselves as well they're not quite sure exactly um what what's happening beyond them you know so you work in quite a small area and you don't know what you know exactly you know someone's taking care of it or you hope they are but you don't really know and that's a, that's part of having all your policies and standards and procedures for documentation documented and accessible so i think it's something that that everyone's gonna find needs work yeah 
Um, anybody else want to tell us about the experience with that table and, and um, populating that table? <clears throat> so I, if I had to do it, and I, <laughs> I was just thinking about it for, I know Sandy's collections, the Herbaria have got a whole lot of policies and procedures. <clears throat> And I don't know, I actually don't know where to start looking for them. I think they're on a drive somewhere, but I don't know where it is. And it might be on our inner web. And the challenge with that is that you can't access it unless you log in to the network through Sandy's um, servers. And if you're working at home, you can't, you can't do that. Um, Kulurwa? Good afternoon, everyone. Do you hear me? Yes, we hear you go. Yes, no, I wanted to to explain on the part that you just uh, asked us when we fill in the the, the, ta the table, if I may say. Uh, it was a bit mm -hmm. tricky for me, simply because uh, at that time I was doing it alone, not yet uh, I discussed it with my colleagues as I as we as I am attending with uh, with the group. So when we were on the group, it was much easier for me to understand uh, whatever that they are asking on the, on the table. So it was much easier, even though some of the, of the questions uh, we say, we said on our table are not applicant, applicable, simply because we've tried to, to, to ask uh, the people that we thought that they are reliable for the for, 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 for the documents, or I can say for some of the things that we wanted at that time. But some of the things we didn't find them. And then, so we wrote whatever that we wrote. Otherwise, it was a bit tricky for me when I was alone. That is what I wanted to share because it's a bit difficult if you are doing it alone, except you mm -hmm. want, you went, you go outside and ask people so that they, you can tell them. Because I, to my honesty, I normally tell them how I understand it, the way I understand it. And then Roberta and also the Demashiane explained it to me before we even start the, 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 the table and then they, they explain everything and then it was much easier for me. Thank you. Okay, thanks Kuluwa. So that is a good point. So some, I mean, often it's gonna be much easier if you do this in a group. And if you don't, if you haven't got a group, then you'll have to ask people. So um, I think that's a good point. Okay, if there's nothing else, then let's just go through that table, just in case anyone has any questions. Um, all right, so you should be seeing it now, the Word document. Um, I know that that when we did the, um, the, the manual and we had all those working group meetings, we always had big discussions about an accession register and whether it's a hard copy book or whether it can be a computer, you know, a, a database or a file, Excel spreadsheet on a computer. So there's two different things. There's your accession register and there's a catalog book or an inventory. And this is quite difficult. And there's also that um, for everything that comes into the institution. So if someone um, sends you a loan, it's not yours, so it won't go into your inventory, but it, it needs to be recorded somewhere when it, as soon as it comes in. If somebody brings a box of things that they want identified, they're gonna take them away again, but you need to record that it came in. So um, maybe Audrey is, is Audrey here. Maybe she can just clarify for us again. So the catalog book or your inventory is a record of what's in the collection. But your accession register, is that everything that comes in, Audrey? Afternoon, everyone. Yes, Michelle, you are correct. The catalog book is everything that is usable as a research specimen and will end up in a database. Whereas the accession book is everything that comes in in an institution, whether it's after a field trip or as a donation, 
that you can even uh, register or record is just a lot, one jar with spiders and scorpions or a box of this and that. And after a person has sorted through to see which specimens are usable as research specimens or as just education specimens, then those that are usable as research specimens will go to the catalog book and everything else still needs to have been recorded because it has entered an institution. So there will be a record of that in the accession book. Okay, all right, thanks, thanks Audrey. So I think it's really, it is important to, to keep that record of everything that comes in as it's received, that you don't have things piling up in the corner and three years later, you can't remember where it came from and whether there was anything associated with it, or if there were any restrictions or limitations. So you need to look at that. And I've put you a hard copy book and I think that that's what the decision was. So it should be a hard copy register because if it's just a file, people can go in there and delete records. So I think that the requirement, it might be the ICOM requirement is, is that it's a hard copy book. Um, so have you got one of those? And then um, have you got a catalog book? an inventory of everything that's in the collection. So once it's got a barcode or a number um, and it's been put into the collection, there must be a record of it. And what we've said is it can be an electronic database, but um, somewhere there is a, an, a thing that it must be, there must be a permanent record, which means that there must be a printout dated and put on file for your, your um your inventory or your catalog. Um, and then you need all your documents associated with your accessions, permits, donation books, donation forms, sorry, anything else that comes in with, with, a, with your accessions, with the, with the material. So where do you put those things? Um, they may be hard copy. Do you scan them? Do you put them in a ring file? Where is that file put? Um, and then an overview of each collection. So this, uh, this is another assignment. We'll talk about that just now. But is there information about that collection, especially like a summary of it, um, what's in it, uh, where it came from, who's worked on it and who's contributed to it, and where is it stored? Has there been anything happening to it? You know, has anything major happened to it? So that kind of a file or a folder or something about this collection. And then all your policy standards and procedures, do you have them? Um, where are they? Can all the staff access them? And then your monitoring records for pests. So this may not be applicable if you only have wet collections. You might not do monitoring, then it would be a NA, not applicable. Monitoring record for climate, um, I think we all need that. So, um, so this is, you should, be, you should be filing it somewhere. Derek said this is all digital and so it will go straight um, onto the onto computer somewhere. But how do you know that it's gonna be kept there? Um, and then all your risk assessment records. So have you done a risk assessment? What did you find? What did you do in, in response to um, addressing risks? All of that, whether it's electronic or hard copy. All your records of disasters. Did you have any disasters? It must be written down when it happened, what happened. Can you find anything like that? And then all your health and safety risk assessments all your incident reports for health and safety. I know I've seen the one at Durban Natural Science Museum. They've got a book and I'm sure Lee knows and Zama knows exactly where that book is. And then your air monitoring reports also, did you find, can you find them? Do you know where they are? Maybe it's all kept by your um, health and safety people in HR or in corporate and you can't access them, but you know that they, they um, look after them, that's fine, you can always say that. Um, and then your health monitoring, so um, this is often um, confidential. 
So if somebody goes for health monitoring, you don't keep the, the um, outcome of that. So we, there is a thing to be careful about, personal information. So, but do you know that on these days, um, the post, which people, the people in the collection, they went for medical. And the next year they went for their medical, they had these things tested. Uh, your health and safety training, have you had first aid training? Is that recorded somewhere? Can you find that? And then all your access request forms, your loan book or your loan file, that might be um, electronic linked to your database, your visitor register. So I know at Sandy they've got a visitor book. Um, do you keep that? Where do you keep the old ones? Can you find it? Um, all your documents associated with loans, that's your agreements, your courier documents. Where are they? And then your um, register of tissue sample supply, that might be in your database, actually. Material transfer agreements, all your permits, do you know where they're kept, who keeps them? I know at Sandy Carr and Bear used to keep all of our permits in a filing cabinet and electronically. Um, and that's fine if that's the way it's done. Your register of data, data or images supplied, do you keep a record of it? Is it in the database? Field notes, is there one place where everybody has to put their field notes? Where is it? What about historic field notes? All those wonderful old um, field notes books that the old timers used to write every day. Data sheets, art, images, so it might be old slides or old prints, um, electronic photographs and other images. Do you know where to look for them? Do you know where they're stored? Um, collection documentation policy. So all of these, number 10, are related to um, documents about your documents. So do you have a collection documentation policy? Do you have collection documentation standards? And do you have collection documentation procedures? So that's no, 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 that's fine. That's your assessment. And like Lee says now, it gives you some indication of what you need to do. So it's not like you're going to fail if you go, no, no, no. It just means I've done my assessment. Now we know, I know what I have to tell somebody or we have to work on. And then are there copies of all your accession registers? So your catalog book or your accession register. Um, is there a scan of it um, or a, a photocopy? And then are they back up? So that's your, all your questions. Are there any um, things here that are not clear or puzzling? No. So this thing about, is it up to date? When last was it updated? So if you don't have a policy that says all policies will be reviewed every five years, then you don't know what out of date is. Um, is it up to date? So some things it's easy to see, oh, there's been so much that's happened since this was written. But a policy can be 10 years old if you don't know how often, if you don't have a policy about how often it must be updated, then you can't say it's outdated. Um, Eunice? Hi, good afternoon. I wanted to ask, if we have for the department and not for the, for the collection, can it be yes? For example, the health and safety ones and the... Uh, other ones, apart from the section register and the cousin, can it be yes if it is for the department, not for the collection? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So, so I would say yes, it can. Um, but then put that in the notes. So the, you'll see that last column is a notes column, um, and you can say the, it's for the de, for the department, not specifically for the collections. Because it may be that you need um, a separate policy for the collections, but you've got something that you operate under. But, but it may be, um, and when we when we talk about, for example, health and safety, um, there's a lot of health and safety things that policies that that miss the um, 
issues for for connections. So yes, do you say it? Say yes, we've got one, and then put it in the notes. It's for the department, not specifically for the connections. Maxine. Hi, Michelle, and good afternoon, everyone. I wanted to find out with the catalog book. A book or inventory does the Brahms database serve as an inventory catalog inventory? Yeah, so uh, yeah, so we have an inventory, uh, but it hasn't been updated in maybe the last 20 years, and so the reasoning behind that is everything's on Brahms, so we can just print off from Brahms and stick it on there. So, would that suffice? Okay, so that's a good question. That's we've had lots of debates. Audrey, somebody from the group, you want to um, give us some input about this? It's one of the most critical um, aspects of the documentation for collections. Audrey? Yeah, so this was always coming up <laughs> during the manual development. So eventually it was agreed that because people had accession registers and then they stopped for whatever reason, but mostly it could be traced back to when we started to keep electronic records. However, that should not have been the case because if you are an institution keeping CITES regulated material, you should have an accession register, which is a hard copy. That's why you have the hard copy there. It's explained in the manual somewhere, I think in the acquisition chapter which is where it comes from. It is also an ICOM standard. And I think the South African version, the SAMA, also adopted it. So these are not the things that we came up with and, and put together somewhere and said that they should be followed. So it should be a hard copy accession register, but because there has been many years that uh, people stopped keeping them. So in the meetings, we agreed that people can do exactly what Maxine was suggesting, go to their uh, data records and print out material. But I remember even then it was um, debated because anyone who has rights to access the database on Specify or on whatever platform the institution is keeping it can go in there and alter the records. How sure are we that the records are still the same? Because according to the whole point of CITES asking for people to keep that is that the record should not be altered. That's why they should be in a hard copy. Sure, if the name of the species or genus changes, that can be altered. But anything, everything else should remain as original as possible. So on a database, if someone new is starting and they go in there and they make an error and they edit all the records which are similar to that location or depends on what it is that they'll be trying to fix. So the question was raised, how then will we be able to trust that everything that is in the database? Of course, um, institutions are not the same. Some institutions were saying they can trace that back because they have um, human capacity to do that. While for others, it should not even be something that should be known that the actual record has been altered. So, yeah, but we yeah. ended up saying that people should, from this point onwards, keep um, accession registers again and not stop using them, as well as use the um, the electronic um, databases, which will be, in a way, this versus this, maybe at some point, this will correct the other because the accession register will have the original uh, record entered. Uh, thanks, Audrey. So I remember this was a very difficult discussion. So yeah, as Audrey says, there used to be accession registers. And, and I think it, if you're doing this exercise, if you're doing this assignment, go and look. You've got accession registers. Um, you might have catalog books. And you um, can say we've got these and they go up to whatever date, and after that, we didn't have them. Um, I know that the NACF has been giving funding to a lot of institutions to buy hard copy books now again. Um, and you can say, you know, but from that date, where it was, which was the last date that these books were used, there's nothing, um, and now see if there is a new book that's being used. 
And I would say, so, so we, we agreed that it, was, it would not be feasible to create um, a handwritten hard copy for, the, for what hadn't been done. And so you can just print out some selected fields of your database and you put that as a file. That's a permanent record. You will be able to see if somebody's scratched anything out, unlike the electronic version, which you won't know if somebody's deleted, you might be able to, to, to trace it, but if somebody's clever enough, they can get rid of that record entirely. So that's not a permanent record. Um, so, but a print, printed art version is, as, is maybe as best we're gonna get. And then we're encouraging people to start using it now again. So yeah, and it's like Audrey says, that's the standard because if you, if you don't have that permanent record, people can just delete things from it and throw them away and steal them. I mean, how many <laughs> institutions have lost rhino horn over the last years? And, and there was no record of it anywhere. Or if there was, it just was lost. All right, so, so that's a difficult one, but I think this is an assessment. Look at what you've got and what you've been doing. You know, what can you see there? Um, any other questions about the table? This chat box, let me just see. They will need, okay, this is from Aisha. Thanks, Aisha. So let me just see. So that was Maxine's question. Can the Brahms database serve as a catalog inventory? And this is from Aisha, so that's very useful. The auditors have instructed us that going forward, they will need to see the printouts of our databases annually. They've also asked that it be signed by the managers. So that's, that's important. Um, so they are asking for it. So there you go. Thanks, thanks Aisha. That's useful to know. All right, so let me stop sharing that and go back to the presentation. So that one might take you a bit of time just scratching around trying to see what you can find. And um, but as Kalurwa said, uh, work with other people, ask other people. Okay, so there's the... That was the first part of your question of your assignment was to do that table. And then the second part of that assignment was to work either individually or as a group and to do either of these um, projects. The draft a collection documentation policy for your institution or draft an overview of the collection that you work in or you're responsible for. And the details of what needs to go into that overview are in the manual. So there's a choice here. You might think that the collection documentation policy is really not your thing and it should be done by higher level. You can't, you don't want to do something for the institution. Um, then that's fine. Then you can do the overview. Um, and let's Look at this. So a collection management, uh, collection document management policy. So some institutions might have a high level document management policy, not specifically collections. So you can also see, does your institution have a document management policy that you can use as a, as a kind of a guide, although the specifics will be much, um, you know, you'll have to put more, um, information specific to the collections. So this, um, you know, we said there's lots of documents um, from the past, there's lots of documents from the present, and they need to all last into the future. And you need a policy for this. Um, so it should say something that all the documents relating to the collections will be retained by the institution but maybe not all of them forever, might be different. Um, you need to say something about originals and duplication. So do you keep digital um, copies of all your hard copies? Do you keep hard copies of all your digital information? 
where should everything be stored um, and that you, you don't have to say how to do the date and version, but you, sh you should say all documents must be dated and versioned. You have to say something about your archival documents. So um, where are they kept? You know, something about them. I mean, we work in, in institutions that date back many, many years. And I bet you, you've all got basements or hidden rooms full of old files and folders and boxes full of documents, old papers. What do you do with them? Can you just keep accumulating them? They take up space. Some of them are like falling to pieces. Some of them, you don't know what they are. I bet you've all got that. Um, so your archival documents, your access control, who can access your documents, disposable, disposal, and whether there is authorization required. So can you just throw out those old things or do you need some kind of authorization? And also include your images. So your art and your, your photographs, um, which are also really important um, documentation. So that's just a broad kind of overview of what would go into document management policy. But um, this is just some ideas. This isn't the one thing for everybody. It's just an idea of what a collection documentation policy would look like. So, you know, I just put this together. I kept thinking of other things to add. I took some of this from the manual. But there's basically 12 points, and that's probably the maximum you should have in your policy. So there should be something about your institutional policy standards and procedures. You must say something that should follow a, an approval and a sign-off process. So you can't just make up your own policy, just keep it and implement it yourself. It goes through a process. Um, your policies should say something about that all of them must have a date and a version and say who's responsible and that they should be kept on file somewhere um, where it's centralized, accessible. And also that you should make your um, policies and your standards at least um, accessible on your institutional website. And then you can say however long you think um, between reviews. Um, you might just choose to say it must be reviewed periodically or regularly. And then what do you do with outdated versions? Do you keep them um, for a minimum period of time and then throw them away or discard them? Do you keep them forever? Do you, as soon as you've got a new one, do you throw the old one away? So all of that's guided by your policy. And then there should be a, a statement about um, you know, all documentation associated with acquisitions must be maintained permanently on file. You never throw it away. So it can be electronic, can um, also be hard copy, but we, you, know, that you must say it must all be kept. Otherwise people do just throw it away. And then this is like a policy statement. There must be a record of every single collection object or lot that comes into the institution and that's your accession register, whether it's on a temporary or permanent basis, must be kept in your register book, your accession register. As soon as that thing comes into the collection or within a day or within two days. And then all the collection, all the objects in the collection must be recorded in an inventory and there must be a permanent record of all objects. So you never, even if you throw that object away because it's been eaten by insects, you don't delete the record, it stays there forever. Um, all collection preservation and conservation actions must be documented and records retained. Um, so this is what I think Lee was saying. So if you've done anything, all your conservation actions, that's not required by law, but it's required for the scientific credibility of those specimens. So you can keep it in your database with that specimen. So if, if you had to glue somebody's wings back on, 
then you record that in the database next to that specimen. Um, if something dried out and you had to rehydrate it, it should be recorded in the database. That you re it was dried out on this date, you rehydrated it following this process. And then um, there must also be uh, records of your collection levels. We've talked about this, all your monitoring and um, when you did checks and if you reorganize the collections or anything you've done, there must be a record that's in your policy it's stated, your access policy and the, about the documents. This is on a, so we have to keep all our documents related to access. We keep all our documents related to disaster, all our health and safety documents, backup copies and storage of documents. So this should be in your policy. Um, I just made this up, you, don't, you might not put this in, so hard copy documents to be scanned and kept in the document management system, might be an electronic document management system, um, that you need to back them up according to your institutional backup policy. And then these are just some general points, all your documents must be accurately labeled, dated and stored in an appropriate folder, um, confidential documents must be flagged, an access control process implemented, something about your archival or historical catalog book succession registers, field notes must be stored in the reference section of the library. It could be in the strong room, like Derek said. And then a policy about them, you may not remove them from, from the institution without the approval of the CEO. Some of you mark your institution might say they cannot under any circumstances ever be removed from your institution. And then something else, and this relates to the compliance, the auditors might look for your chain of um, authorizations. So if you decided to donate specimens or a collection to somebody else, where is the authorization? You have to keep that chain of, of authorizations. Um, if there's any other decisions, um, moving a collection from one room to another, from one building to another. Where is the, the approval and the authorization? So you might have minutes from meetings, you might have memos, you might have a notice from the CEO. Um, that all needs to be managed and kept because the auditors will ask for that. So those are the kinds of points that you can have in, in the policy. But I recognize that this is quite difficult because a lot of it will be on an institutional level and, and maybe not on a collection based level. Uh, yeah, so when if you if you decide you're going to do this, um, whether it's part of the manual implementation of the course, just think about your circumstances and the systems that you have. So what I put there might not be appropriate for, for your institution. Um, you might need additional points um, in it, but you might say, well, this is never going to be feasible. So you don't have to um, stick to what you've got. You can't say, well, we can't have a policy because we don't have any cupboards or shared folders or anything like that. So we can't have a policy. You can't say that. You've got to think about what you could set up, but be realistic about what's feasible. Um, so if you don't currently have an electronic document management system, and I know we've been trying to get one at Sandy for a long time, um, because that's the ideal thing to have, what are the other options for storing, accessing, and managing electronic documents? So you might decide it will be on your servers, in a, in a folder, in, in subfolders. And then for your hard copy documents, um, where should they go? Even if they don't go there at the moment, maybe they just sit on people's desks or on your bookshelf in your office. But you might say the policy really should say that they go into a secure, um, safe or strong room or into the library reference section. So you need to think about, about all of that. So remember, again, like we said this morning, your policy should not include details of how to do things or processes or forms or templates. 
So always think, is this something that should go into an SOP or a workflow or into a standards document? And sometimes it's quite hard to, to know exactly. So you should not include details of things that could change often. So um, think about, is this going to change you know, every year? If, if it does, it might be something in a procedure, not in a policy. Because you don't want to keep revising your policy all the time or changing it. All right, so that's some guidelines for the policy. And it can be a lot shorter than I, than I had. But I had those 12 points just because I thought they were really important. Okay, any questions, comments? Anybody try to do this policy? I think someone did. I did see on the assignments. I think it was the Council for Geoscience people did it. No. <laughs> Is anyone planning to do it? No. <laughs> but let us see where. Um, Michelle, I just had uh, a question. What happens in the scenario? Like, I, I know that, like, for example, with the first table, you said just because, you know, you, you have to say, no, 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 it doesn't make it wrong, right? It's just that you've done your assessment here. So now with this second part, if your intention is to do um, an overview of the collection that you um, work in or are responsible for, and the same goes for that, then what? Because I feel like I'm coming up short. Okay, so, so you've done your table and there's just like no, 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 no through there, all right? And then you decide, okay, I'm going to do a collection overview and you go and you look and you can't find any information about your collection overview. So is that what you're saying? Um, in my instance, it wouldn't be like a whole, like too many no's in the first table, yeah. but definitely in the, in the, in the second part. Okay, so for the collection overview, you're saying you can't find information about the collection. Yes. Okay, all right, we're going to look at that now. So we will look at what should be in that collection overview. Um, just, and I think, think that will help you, your, and I'll answer your question when we're looking at that. Uh, I think I think maybe I didn't explain myself properly. I was I was giving um, the 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 thing that you said about the table as an example that the no's don't necessarily like reduce points. Like does the same rationale now carry over for the second part? That's that's what I meant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's the same. I mean, if you if you're gonna do a collection overview. And you can't find anything about the history of that collection. Then you write in your overview, no information available on the history of this collection. So then you can't lose points for that. You know what I mean? If it's not there, it's not there. There is other information that you can include. Uh, but I think it's important to say, you know, I, I looked and, and I can't find any historical information about the origins or anything that's happened to this collection. Okay. Thank you very that's much. A, okay. All right. So for those people who decide to do the collection overview, and it's probably a lot, um, a lot more feasible to do it. You need to have the name of your collection, what it covers, so what's its scope, what's in it, what kind of things, and a brief description. So it's a herbarium collection comprising um, 15,426 herbarium sheets of, of mounted pl dried plant specimens, as well as six boxes of large seed cones, <laughs> I'm making this up as I go along, seed cones that can't be mounted, and those are stored in boxes. 
and then to say, so you must say how many, you should be able to do that, even if it's approximately between this and this number or approximately this number of individual objects of what, of each kind. How it's organized, so you can say it's um, organized by whatever the plan people use, the APG3 or the APG4, um, or the arrangement of the plant families and then within each family it's ordered by genus alphabetically and within each genus the species are ordered um, alphabetically and then it's by date of collection or acquisition. They must say how is it organized and then where is it housed? It's housed in the National Herbarium Building in the in, Victoria National Botanical Gardens in Victoria um, and it's in four wings and also a basement where the gymnosperms are kept and then about its storage conditions. So what's the ideal temperature and humidity? Um, it should, it's, it's um, ideal light is there any climate control equipment there? Is there fire detection? So yes, there's uh, air conditioners that are set at 18 degrees. There's a um, fire sensor and a gas fire suppression system. The building is solid, although there um, may be some problems with the roof leaking um, after heavy rain. I'm making this up, <laughs> don't quote me. Um, it's all in metal cabinets with metal shelves and the, the um, herbarium sheets are in uh, cardboard folders. Uh, and it's in a very good condition. It's been very well maintained, although um, there's one collection that hasn't had a curator for the last 30 years and it may not be up to date in terms of the scientific curation. So that kind of, that's your story. If you've got history of it, that's even better, but you might not have. So it was started in 1902 when it was um, first stored at the Union Buildings in Pretoria, and then in 1963 it was moved to this building when it was constructed, the dark buildings, and the date that this report was come from Pilot and the Responsible Authority, and it, that can be updated every five years or so. All right, so does that answer your question, Sanelli Seaway? So, I mean, if you don't know the history, you can just say there's no information available about the history of this collection. Right. Any questions from anybody about the collection overview? I think it's, you know, you might think, well, why bother with that, really? But I think. It's like your starting point for anything um, to know what you've got and and a summary of of all the issues and how it's looked after and where it came from. I mean, we we really need that just as a starting point for everything else. Eunice, hi Michelle. Good afternoon. Thank you for for that. I wanted to ask if the signing or do we need to put the name of the person that the that compiled it, and if the person is not around or there's nobody that signed it up, should I? What should I do? So, so you should say who compiled the reports, and um, some of it might be, you know, a person who was there twenty years ago. They've gone now, so they can't sign off on it. But you can say, um, I used information from the report of. Um, Dr. Fisher, who retired in 1986, and I've updated it, and then you sign off on it. So you might be using other people's information, and you must give credit to them. Is Rendani here? No, she's not here now. Uh, check. Not in attendance. Sorry. She's not here for this one. 
Yeah, she was here this morning. So um, I'm sure she won't mind if I show you hers because I think she's done it really nicely. The way she's given credit to the other to to um, the people whose work she's used. She actually did a very nice um, nice collection overview. But um, I think it is important. So, so that's actually a good question, um, Eunice. Just it's just a matter of saying what um, what the source of your information was. Who was the author of it, and what was the source of it? So, do have a list of references, or um, even if they're not published, a list of documents and the author for it. And then you sign off as the compiler because you might have put all of that together. Um, any other questions about the collection overview? I think it's a really nice exercise to do if your institution doesn't have one. Andrea? I was just asking as well about the um, compiled by. All of our documents have been written compiled by the in our annual helmet group. Is that wrong? It must be with a specific person. No, uh, so it can be, um, it can be a, a particular group. So, but did you put your names as well? Um, the names are in the document um, to say who's busy with what research and so on. But it doesn't say it was compiled specifically by person A or B. Yeah. So it's very, it's very, it is important to, to say who compiled it. So you can say okay. it was by this, and then in brackets, the names of those people. Okay. Um, and is, yeah, so it's important because going forward, if somebody else wants to cite that information, it's good to, to acknowledge the people's, people who actually contributed to it. It's also um, the credibility of that information. So you can look at, at the people who wrote it and you can say, okay, you know, um, Kirsten, Juncker, and Andrea Spickett were people who worked in that connection. They know about it. And so what's here is actually um, a, 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 um, pretty gonna likely to be accurate. If it was written by a student or an intern who'd been there for three weeks, you, you know, your name and what their position was. So, okay, Audrey's sent me Rendani's. I don't like using people's um, <laughs> work without their uh, approval, but I, d I really don't think she'll mind because it's, it's showing something good. So she did do a presentation on this at the discussion forum when we had the discussion forum for the collection documentation. Sorry. All right, so I hope you can see it. Can you see it? We can. Okay, good. All right, so, so Rindani did do a presentation on the collection overview. Um, but yeah, she's got the name, the description, you know, of, of the groups that are there, its purpose, why, you know, this, so this one is a bit different. It's actually um, a collection for teaching biology to undergraduates, yours might be for research. Um, and then the history, she's got a whole history here, when it, you know, who set it up in 1903, and then he retired, and then he took over, and he came in. And what happened, it was in a much bigger building, bigger room. And then um, they made it smaller. And here, so she's got here, the information was obtained from Prof Brothers and Prof Perrin through Preshni Singh, who organized Museum Day in 2018. So she's given acknowledgement. And then um, she's also got the references that she used. Um, she says, you know, so how many and, and each type of specimen, and she's got how is it organized, where is it housed, what are the storage conditions, 
um, what proportion is included in the database on inventory, the condition, is it in good condition, is it, are there any problem, tough problems, when was it compiled, and then who, who compiled it. So she hasn't signed it as often, that's fine, I mean it's, it's an assignment, it's not the actual thing. So I think that that's, you know, now anybody saying what's that museum at UKZ in, there's the whole story about it. Okay. All right. So anything, anybody else want to ask, comment? You're all feeling better about this assignment. I think that collection documentation policy is quite a challenge. The table should be fine. Scratch around if you, if you might not find everything. Don't look for months and months to see what you can find. And then, you know, doing that um, selection overview is a nice exercise if you don't have one already. If you have one, you, you can maybe update, expand, fill in any gaps. All right. Last chance for questions, comments. Um, uh, Lee, did you share those two extra uh, columns in the table? Yes, so the one is, um, I just listed it as GRAP 103 compliance, and it's a basically, I mean, I've done it as a tick box, but can just put yes or no. And then the other is to actually list if that particular documentation speaks to an act or a regulation. Um, so for instance, yeah, like, I mean, we need to have an inventory of what's on our premises because of Section 20 compliance. Um, and that's basically your acquisitions, you know, accessions. So once you put that in context, you actually see that in quite a few instances, one lot of documents or one document actually feeds into numerous, it's regulatory, it's scrap on a three compliance. Um, yeah, so you actually didn't actually see it. Uh, and from there you can determine what are the documents that you ought to prioritize that are lacking. Um, so those that check a few boxes should be the first ones that you, you start doing. Okay, all right. So Sarah, so if for those people who, who are interested in this and, and actually um, using it for your institution, maybe just add those two columns to the table. Um, if, you, if you're if not like into graph and legislation, it's just way beyond the, your scope of work, then you don't have to worry about it. Um, but it is an important thing to think about. Is, is this for, is it legal compliance? Um, is, it a, is it for scientific credibility? Um, is it an auditable, you know, do, will the auditors look at this? So think about, about it. We're not just keeping papers for paper's sake. Um, all right, uh, Fulu? Um, for me, it's a comment. Um, it's just something that came to mind that uh, the main, just to remind everyone that the aim of the whole course is not for marks, but it's to fix our collections. So honesty is the best policy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thanks, Willu. Yeah, it's true. I mean, we're not going to um, give you low marks because you don't have all of the documents. I mean, that's mostly out of your control and, and often it's historical things. It's from before you started working there, so you can't be penalized. And, and yeah, I mean, we are, we're working, we're trying to get all the institutions to work towards, we know that everybody doesn't have everything now. And it's, and the, the um, whole aim is really just to get people walking in that same direction together. Right, Lee? Oh, sorry, <laughs> that might have been uh, Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, just even if it's not, if people don't include it as part of the, um, the exercise, I mean, I was actually shocked just how many acts there are, everything from 
Occupational Health and Safety Act to the Poppy Act, how you retain donors' information, all of it. It's it's yeah, quite quite mind boggling, <laughs> just how much there is. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, maybe at some point um, we will have to to look at all the different legislation. I mean, I I did that. You also helped with the paper, but that's really around collecting. But how many laws govern um, what we do in these collections and how we do it? It would actually be quite interesting to draw up a list. I don't think I've got all the legislation. So we must actually um, do that at some point between Audrey and other working group members. Um, Michelle, what I can do, because we had to do it for our um, management and our legal department within the municipality, as a starting point, I can um, forward what I had drafted. Um, and they even wanted, well, you know, in terms of violations, what's the penalties? <laughs> and you now go through those X and some of those regulations. It's a bit crazy. Yeah, thanks, Lee. So that would be that would be useful to have that pre preliminary list. And then, you know, I think like the um, paleontologists, they, you know, with the um, they might have additional laws. And the fungi people, they've got that um, non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction legislation that affects them. Um, so yeah, it's it's actually a lot of laws that we operate under. I don't think. Anybody's really paid that whole list. All right. So last chance for any co uh, questions, comments. Um, if not, I hope that this has helped you um, just get some clarity on what's expected for the manual implementation and for the, the course assignment. Don't stress about, again, there's not going to be like one right answer. It's just a matter of, of thinking it through and documenting something that um, shows an understanding, a reflection, an ability to understand what this is all about. So that's it. All right, thanks everybody. So we'll see you next week um, if you're interested in those, those um, tutorials as well. Thanks everyone, bye.